Hi, everyone. Welcome to our third webinar in our symposium, Wrapping Up, Taking Stock, and Moving Forward. Today, we'll be discussing extreme school makeover, space planning, deep cleaning, and safety. Oh, my. I'm Jackie Gadapur Werns, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. And I'm joined today by our regular panelists, Shelly Anderson. Hi, everyone. Nikki Baser. Hi, everyone. Dana Fatori Crumley. Good afternoon. And Jennifer Smith. Good afternoon. We are also very fortunate to have with us today as a guest panelist, Steve Wright, who is a principal at DLA Architects, who has worked for 30 years in the education market. Good afternoon, Steve, and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, and thanks for the invitation. So this is the first of the final four of our webinars, and it's gonna be addressing reopening in the fall, looking at it from different angles and issues. Our plan today is to first provide some insights on how to deal with the physical spaces within your school buildings, with the expectation that the coming school year may look very different than it has in past years. We will take your questions during the final portion of the webinar, so please submit your questions through the Q&A function on Zoom, and we will do our best to answer them during the webinar. As always, if you find yourself looking for more information, or if we're not able to get to your question today, please reach out to one of us for information. Please also make sure you sign up for the remaining sessions in our webinar series, which will occur each Thursday at noon through June 11th. Our next webinar is May 28th at 12 p.m. and is entitled A New Kind of Spaced Out Student, Educating Students with Continued Social Distancing. You can find out more information about the symposium and our other webinars, alerts, blogs, and podcasts on our website at fransic.com. So I'd like to turn to Steve first. Last week, we discussed the Restore Illinois framework and the phased reopening in our webinar. And while we were awaiting IDPH and ISBE guidance on reopening in the fall, we did see some guidance come out from the CDC this week that gave us a preliminary roadmap on what needs to be in place for any time of reopening. One thing that has been consistent is the idea that we may need to think about social distancing in school buildings. So can you start us off with some thoughts on how to think about this in terms of both students and staff, starting with classroom space? Sure. I'm sure that the classroom space is going to be very much different this fall than what the teachers and administrators were used to before March 13th. Um, for instance, we need to respect the social distancing guidelines. And in order to do that, we need to think of the kids represented on a floor plan as basically a 36 square foot bubble, um, just to show, you know, keeping those distances that are required, but also at the same time, just to get an idea of how many kids we can put in an existing classroom. And just to put that in perspective, um, for a classroom of the size of say 700 to 900 square feet, you could put about 12 kids in a classroom. And that's allowing for a teacher zone on one side of the classroom, keeping some common space for um, kids to come in and out of the doorway, but keeping, again, the distance that you need between the kids um, maintained. I would foresee the likelihood of um, hand sinks being installed in the classrooms. Um, those that didn't have them currently, you may need to put those in just to encourage and promote hand washing. Um, and then also I would see some kind of designation on the floor to keep the kids uh, located in the spots that you've designated for them. And just to give them visual, um, some visual cues to make sure that they're maintaining that social distance. So just those are just some guidelines that I would think might be something that we need to keep in mind coming up this fall. 
Well, Steve, all of those things are really, you know, I think interesting and, and make us think about things differently. Is there any distinctions that you've thought about for differences between elementary schools and high schools? Yeah, I would see the high schools following something very similar. However, um, due, the, due to the number of students that we're talking about within a high school, um, high schools these days are utilizing what, what's considered school within a school. And um, when you do that, you can accommodate larger number of students within certain segments of the school. They can be broken out into pods and you can house probably up to about 50 students per pod. And that would be utilizing breakout spaces, classroom spaces, and the corridors as educational spaces, allowing you to maintain the um, social distancing requirements, but also be able to handle larger groups. And in a high school, you could have, you know, up to five or six of these pods, depending on the size of the school. But that would help you distribute the kids across um, the entire building and still be able to have everybody where you need them um, and yet have the separation that's required. Yeah, I mean, it seems like in elementary classrooms, turning to that, you know, I, you're your sort of calculation on the number of students is obviously based on the sort of six foot distancing as I understand it and what the bubble around each kid. Um, obviously school districts that have much younger students are gonna have to think about just the logistics of that, right? So even if you technically can fit all those kids in the space with a bubble, how you maintain that and whether you need less students in that space because those kiddos are sort of interacting in a much sort of more organic way when they're second graders or third graders, they're sitting on the rug, that sort of thing, and how to keep, you might need less students, I guess, potentially in those kinds of spaces. Correct, correct. And education these days promotes collaboration. You want the kids working together. And that is unfortunately something that's going to be affected by the situation we're dealing with with COVID. Um, having to maintain that space is kind of counterintuitive, counterintuitive to, uh, to the collaboration part. But again, I, I do see that um, still being able to keep that same type of interaction between the kids, is just going to look a little bit different. Then what about common areas? So gymnasiums, auditoriums, hallways, anything we should be thinking about there, Steve? Well, those, I mean, those are, are what you would consider common spaces. Um, those spaces I see right now is because of the limited number of kids that you'll be able to have in a classroom, you're gonna have to start utilizing those spaces as educational spaces. For instance, it, for instance in a gymnasium, being a larger space, I could see that being able to be divided up into one class, on one side, another class on another side. Um, same thing within a cafeteria, a large open space where you can have multiple classes within it. Um, quite honestly, I don't see a cafeteria being utilized for some time as a cafeteria. Um, I would anticipate that kids are gonna be end, end up being um, taken care of in the classroom as far as lunch periods go, um, likely bringing their own lunches. And um, as far as food prep within a school, I don't see that happening for some time until this really, you know, gets worked out. Yeah, so what about, I mean, not to, not to dive too deeply, but um, what about things like bathrooms? I mean, I know that that's gonna be on people's minds, you know, it, you know, we can sort of talk about limiting and rotating, but obviously as anybody who's been around a human child in the last, you know, day knows, um, when a kid needs to use the bathroom, they need to use the bathroom. So, you know, any thoughts on space on those in terms or cleaning? What, what do we need to think about there? Uh, very good question. Um, obviously, a very much a necessity um, within, um, within the building. I've been looking at, um, what we're, what we're hearing as far as even businesses 
coming online now. Um, there are recommendations that bathrooms need to be attended to up to three times an hour. Now that's within a, say an office building. Schools are gonna be very much different than that. There, there's continual use. So I would assume that there's going to be a need for continual cleaning. And I can see that as you know, being a full-time job for multiple people. Um, your, your question is, is, is right on because um, that is something, you know, cleanliness, cleanliness within the school is going to be a huge issue. How it's handled, I don't know, but I do see that it's going to be one of the areas that really needs to be addressed. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is going to be just more than a space, in addition to space planning, which is a huge issue, it's also going to be a supervision issue and um, a staffing issue. Like, do you have enough staff in place? I mean, I think back to when I first started teaching a long time ago, people that no, my first job was in a Catholic school and the nuns had very strict guidelines on how many people could go to the bathroom at once and how you walked in the hallway and how much space you left between the person in front of you and the person behind you. And I think that's been sort of discredited now, but if you look at it from a more communitarian perspective, it might be something we have to revisit, but just the staffing and the, the, the labor issues, Shelley, you know, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I can imagine our attendees who are out there listening to the idea that we're going to have to have fully staffed bathrooms all the time. I mean, one from a labor, labor perspective of how are we going to afford that in terms of adding those positions um, from the other side of things, you know, I would be remiss to not, you know, get very anxious about the idea of having an adult in a bathroom all the time with kids. I think there are concerns that are raised there. And so then the idea is do you have to have two people in that bathroom with kids all the time. We have many bathrooms in our elementary and high schools that don't have doors on the stalls. That raises a whole other issue if we've got adults in the bathroom. I think other than that, it's also you know the cleaning as well as how do you keep the kids away from each other in the bathroom, so that social distancing component. I think all of this has so many labor implications. It's really going to be a matter of both being able to work with the unions as well as the funding for all of this additional uh, pieces that are going to be required. And then just on, on the bathroom piece, I wanted to ask a, a follow-up question. Some of what we're reading about safety talks about ventilation and the idea of someone in a, a, a windowless, you know, room all day seems very, I don't know, unsafe from, from some of the recommendations. Is there any talk about, because outside seems a little safer, porta potties or temporary other alternatives for bathroom options i'm not sure i have not um i have not read anything about that but that might be an opportunity um but again there's we need to be able to supervise and um uh, i that, that is a very good question i i don't know the answer to that now jennifer while we're talking about bathrooms do you have any thoughts about toileting needs for diverse learners. Uh, how is that gonna play out with all of this? Well, so that is another space. It's not just our bathrooms that we use in the way that we normally think, but we do have students with, you know, who have uh, toileting needs that either need a direct assist as far as to transition for mobility reasons onto a toilet or even need um, assistance with changing diapers and that kind of thing, perhaps in the nurse's office or other space. So I don't know when you talked about using different spaces. I mean, again, the nurse's office, typically a small space, maybe multiple people. I, I don't know what you said about using the cafeteria for other purposes. It just made me think, gosh, maybe we need some other spaces for that type of activity as well. Um, but, but certainly it's gonna be a requirement to get certain students in the building. Um, there, there needs to be support, not just for uh, students who don't need assistance, but also for students who need assistance with toileting. Yeah, and just uh, speaking of the cafeteria, just circle back, because I, I saw a bunch of questions when Steve had mentioned, um, you know, kids bringing lunch and not serving lunch. Of course, 
all of these issues, you the school districts still do need to uh, comply with the national school lunch and breakfast and in some cases dinner program and the state. And so we are already feeding kids as everybody knows and, and, and districts are making, you know, taking Herculean efforts to, to keep kids fed, which is amazing right now. Those efforts will have to continue. So you will have to think about your food service workers, how you're using your space now. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about protective um, gear later in this, in this, but you will also definitely have to think about those spaces because we will need to continue to feed students under those programs. Right, and I think what Steve was talking about is more making sure when you're giving students meals that they're in containers with yeah. disposable, you know, and that you're not gonna be like having a cafeteria line. It's not gonna look like what we, but it's more going to be like, here's a box, <laughs> here's your lunch with everything in it that you need. Right. Um, so, th I mean, those requirements are going to continue. It's just going to be re-envisioned, I guess, is the best way to put it. So then moving out of the classroom, how do we think about employees in these spaces? So school offices, lunch rooms, where employees are working behind the scenes and the like. Are there ways we can make those spaces safer for employees? Well, it, as you've probably seen in all of the uh, grocery stores that you've been at, the shields that have been put up between the checkout person and, and, um, and the person going through the line. I could see in some locations, if you're within six foot of one another, that there is, you know, a very difficult time to keep the social distancing. I could see shields being put up in between employees, absolutely. Um, it just needs to be looked at as far as where they are really truly required. Um, again, in, a, in an office space, absolutely. But there may be other places where, the, where it's not necessary. Could you use those plastic shields in classrooms for students as well? You know, I think if, if you were say intending to put more students in a classroom, um, I do think it's possibility. And when you do that, as long as you're, if you've got the shields in the right place, then a mask would not necessarily be necessary. Um, and because I know it is gonna be inconvenient and um, unwieldy for the kids to have these things on for very long. Absolutely, I, I mean, I've been dealing with that with my own my own kids, my own grandkids. Um, after a while, it becomes a nuisance. Now, Shelly, are there any employment and labor implications for this in for the um, types of increased supervision and security that we've been talking about? Yeah, I think as I mentioned earlier, I think anything that we're going to do with respect to changing duties that, that individuals have, whether it's from a supervisory perspective, or I think we'll talk about it a little bit later in terms of making sure that people have PPE, all of those components to it are going to have a labor implication. Um, I, I think we would be, it would be you know, not realistic to think that we were gonna impose some new responsibility or some new expectation on our employees and the unions are not gonna come forward and say, we at least wanna say in how that is going to, to look or we want some additional benefit related to being, ha having to do that. So I think we're gonna see that in every component of this. And the earlier we start working with our unions on it, the better. And I say that knowing full well that we don't have any of the answers yet. So we, we know that we need to start talking to them. The specifics of that dialogue though, I think will further develop as we figure out what it's gonna look like next year. Yeah, I mean, I think that you're gonna to need to keep very open lines of communication and get them in on the ground just to make sure that you're not making any surprises. I mean, I was even thinking as we were talking about the lunchroom, I have contracts where the lunchroom is part of the contract. <laughs> Shelly, do you have any of those? Like they have to have a space? Like it's like the faculty lounge. Like you must have a space where you can go to be away from the kids is in many contracts, I think. And that may need to be changed based on how you're using the building and how you're serving kids. You might not have that luxury anymore and it may not be feasible for teachers to eat all together given the restrictions. So I think just the earlier you start the discussion, the better off you are and just giving people the idea that you're gonna to have to just evolve as, it, as we get more information. Yeah, I think not only in terms of, you know, we're talking about the spaces for the 
the students or the staff as well. But I mean, you're talking about everything from, you know, I think Steve had mentioned kind of the school within a school concept. And if, if we're doing that and there's specific entry and exit doors for different groups of kids, you know, who's going to monitor that and make sure that kids aren't crossing over? You know, we were laughing, we were prepping for this. I mean, the idea of it being like Hunger Games and the kids trying to get from one pod to another pod, um, depending upon where they've been assigned, um, you're going to have a lot of responsibility if we're going to you know, have the parents trust us to bring their kids back. We're going to have to be able to assure them in some way that whatever parameters we believe we've got in place, that we have the staff there to make sure to the extent possible that we're able to do it. All of this space discussion, Jennifer, makes me think about uh, special education and all of the complicated requirements that come into play there with respect to where a student needs to be educated. Are there any thoughts that you can share for us on that? Yeah, I think there are a number of issues. I mean, when Steve was talking about the different use of spaces and who's in spaces, so we're going to need to look at IEPs and see what physical requirements are in there for the student, especially accommodation. So if they need access to a sensory room, can we still provide that space? Is it a space? Is it going to be provided in a way that affords the social distancing you're talking about? Um, there's other kinds of specific space accommodations that would need to be reviewed. Another complication that I see when we when Steve was talking about reducing class size, let's say you reduce from 25 to 12, we have the 70-30 rule. I mean, who knows if certain things will be waived, but when you're planning, you could see that you might want to group students in a way that maybe more than 30%, you know, you had met the 70-30 rule in the larger group, but you'd like for certain students to be able to continue to be grouped together. But if you do that, you're going to exceed, the, the subgroup will exceed um, whether that rule will apply to subgroups or we can still technically count the whole class is an issue. If, if there's a greater percentage of special ed class students in a section, um, it might might end up being a change in placement and we need to have a placement discussion and change the IEP or we're going to have some violations. So um, obviously a lot, a lot of issues to think through. So because of all of these space complications, uh, we've been hearing ideas about having kids in shifts. Steve, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I do. Um, and I would say the, the idea of the shifts would I think be more toward the, the high school age group um, simply from the standpoint of you've got a larger number of people, you could likely break down um, the students that, well, let me put it this way. The students that are thriving right now with e-learning, I think it would be a good suggestion to allow them to remain at home if they're doing well and consider the those that are having difficulty or have an IEP that they need to have attended to and need one-on-one -on -one instruction with, um, with a teacher, allow them to come into the school in regular shifts, schedule a regular time to have them come in, whether it be a designated day or a designated time over two or three days, I think it would make some sense to do it that way. I see, again, the, the kids coming in in shifts probably being more high school related, but it would have to be you know, looked at with, with, the, uh, with the grade school level too to see if it does make sense. I do, I do know it, it may extend the school day though you may have to look at extended hours to be able to bring in kids as needed. What do the rest of you all think about that? Any, any thoughts on the legal side? I guess I'll jump in first from the labor perspective. I mean, you better remember that when these contracts are negotiated with teachers, it's based on the amount of time that we currently have in a school day. And the idea will be that if we extend school day by an hour, we're gonna have all the unions calculating what that hour looks like based upon current salary schedule models, which is not necessarily how we would have developed them had we known it was going to be a longer school day or the expectations were gonna be different. So it's really going to take some 
creativity between both parties to come up with something that is actually um, manageable because otherwise they're just, we're not going to be able to afford to continue to educate kids in a way that is best for kids, um, best for staff, because there's gonna be all these components that cost so much money. And at some point we've got to all come together and say, this is where we're gonna put our priority and this is where we're gonna put our money. Yeah, I think the same analysis sort of applies to students. I think you have to think about, um, you know, what the needs are for different groups of students. I think what Steve said, and that's, that's a very big mind shift for us in education because it's all about being equal. And I think <coughs> use the, the other term, we have to think about being equitable and, and not so much equal. And I think there are students that can learn remotely. I think that that's been one of the takeaways, I think, in some of the articles I've seen that some of them are thriving. I think that kids can learn in a modified remote learning setting where maybe they do it a few days a week remote in a few days, but not all kids can learn that way. And I think we're gonna have to acknowledge that and you know, bring, our, bring the parent community along with that notion that we need to sort of behave in what's best for the community of students that we're dealing with. And that could be different based on people's individual needs. Yeah, I think that's a, re that's a really good point, Dana, and a really hard conversation, right? Because even if your kid is um, doing fine, let's say with remote learning, you know, I think parents are frustrated with the limitations of that, regardless of how well their student is doing. And so you end up with a, a, a very complicated equity conversation, right? Which we have already, but sort of manifested even, even greater with this, um, you know, you end up with potential discrimination claims or um, claims where kids are being sort of grouped into categories in a way that's that feels troubling to the community and to parents. So I think that those are all really complicated issues that we're going to need to think about at, if we end up with some sort of shift system or, you know, structured schedule where kids are coming in and out. So I think I think that's right to start thinking about that now in that conversation. So we actually have received a lot of questions on this kind of spacing issue. So before we move on to talking about some other things, I thought I would try to, to address some of those questions um, with you all. Uh, let's see. So uh, one person had a question interesting of whether or not if is six feet required if the students are wearing masks. So uh, Steve, do you have thoughts on what the recommendations are like within the classroom? If everyone's wearing a mask, is it okay to have all of the desks the way they normally would be set up? I, well, I personally still think there would be an issue, but um, I don't know from the CDC standpoint if that is, you know, how they would, how they would view that. But I, I still think that with a mask, you would not necessarily keep the exact same layout that the classroom would have been. I, I still see a reduced number of kids in the classroom. Yeah, I mean, I, based on what I've read, I, I don't think that putting everyone in a mask is really gonna address the issue because you still have, especially with little kids, they can have a mask on, but they're sticking their hand under their mask or they're wiping their hand on somebody else after they sneeze. So I, I do think the social distancing, while it's difficult and so counter, intuitive to how we teach today is something that we're going to have to, you know, think about and, and implement regardless of whether they're wearing masks. And I think that's, but again, it's, it's all about how close you are for how long too. Like, I, I do think wearing masks would allow people to approach each other in a more close way. And Jen, when we're thinking about special ed kids, you know, if we have an adult in a mask can maybe approach that student in a, in a more, in a closer way and address that need in the moment and then move away again. Yeah, this is a little bit of a, uh, an aside, but my, my father's a retired healthcare worker and we were together in a space this weekend where we could watch people coming out of a store and everyone, their natural instinct is they come out, they take the mask off and then they touch their face immediately. And my dad said, you know, when he was trained as far as the, the masks and when they suit up for surgery and everything, you, um, it's a very hard thing to learn to take off masks and not just immediately um, spread contamination. That is a very hard skill. And 
I, I don't know. I'm, we're, not, we're not seeing adults be successful with that. So I, I don't think we can rely on that as far as students. I, I mean, that's just one person's opinion. But um, uh, I mean, uh, and other concerns are it's going to be contrary to IEP accommodations. So we have, you know, accommodations where they can chew on something. Well, how is that? You know, that um, th there's just a variety of concerns with relying on that. So another question is that uh, it appears that the CDC guidance uh, provides some flexibility. So uh, for those of you who reviewed our alert about the CDC's um, decision trees, you saw that there's a language like as required or as feasible or if feasible. And so the question is, doesn't that give us some flexibility to consider, but not necessarily implement all of the recommendations if it's not feasible to do so? Shelley, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think that this is the part that, you know, we really are gonna have to look at this with a lot of flexibility because I think it is not going to be manageable for every school district to do everything that the CDC is recommending as a best practice. I think we're gonna have to look at, you know, what your particular school can do given your funding, given your space parameters, given what your staff is willing or not willing to do. And so I think that the, the concern there is if you, if a school district decides not to implement a specific recommendation and something happens, can it then be traced back to that such that we've got a possible, a lawsuit or some form of potential liability related to them not following that recommendation. So to answer the question, I do not believe these are requirements anymore. I think the CDC recently changed its language from required to if feasible. I think in recognition that it wasn't going to be possible to do them all. Um, but I think we just have to be very careful about what we are and are not implementing based on potential liability issues. And we are still waiting for that guidance from the IDPH and ISB. Uh, it seems as though they are uh, sometimes a day behind us on topics or uh, a week behind us on topics. So I am expecting that, we, I think we're expecting that guidance to be out any day now. And it may include some more restrictive or required language than the CDC. Right, and I think wherever you have, I'm sorry, Nikki, um, wherever you have like uncertainty, like we do now, the best practice is to be, to have a group of people together. I know that one of our questions was talking about healthcare teams and that's been in some of the guidance and some of the news articles about establishing a healthcare team. And I think having a team of professionals in the school, somebody from, you know, health, somebody from mental health, some, you know, physical health, school nurse, mental health, social worker, um, leaders in these different areas, your leaders in instruction, administrators, buildings and grounds people, as long as you're making reasonable decisions that are informed you're going to be protecting yourself from liability. It's, there's not gonna be like this one true path. You're gonna to have to be flexible and use the people that you have and the, the, the expertise that you have to, to be flexible and make decisions. Yeah, I was, just, I, was just gonna, I was just gonna add that um, I, I'm looking forward to the ISB and IDPH guidance. I do feel like I'm sure many have the same sensation when reading the CDC guidance that it's, it does not feel like those folks had been in a school building recently um, in terms of just some of the recommendations and guidance were, were hard to envision with especially our younger kiddos. Um, so I do think that it'll be helpful to see, um, you know, we can, I know we have a lot of questions that we'll talk through still on, on space issues. Um, and hopefully again, we'll be getting some further guidance. So we had a question about bus transportation and, and pointing out that before you even get students in the doors, you've got to figure out bus transportation. So any, any thoughts on that at this time? Well, one thought is that if we're, if we can't safely transport, I mean, there's, there's both your general transportation and the mile and a half requirement, but then again, you're going to have to look at IEPs and some special education students are entitled to, to transportation in their IEP. So um, this is a prerequisite sort of issue, or if you can't do it safely, I ha haven't really thought about it. if you just can't provide transportation safely, can you reopen? I guess that's a, a question. Um, there's been, I would say, a trend away from 
taxis for special education and towards buses for safety reasons. I'm not sure if limiting the people though, we might now reverse and, and start to go back to taxis because it would just, to keep it just a driver and a student. Um, I think when th those issues would need to be addressed, I agree. So we had a question, Steve, that maybe you might have some thoughts on about how we can use hallways as instructional spaces and be compliant with fire or life safety issues. Any thoughts there? Yeah, um, what we are looking at right now is from an educational standpoint, a lot of corridors, I mean, there's been a trend of using out, um, I was gonna say outdoor space, but outside the classroom, being within the corridors as educational spaces, you're allowed to do that as long as you don't block the, uh, the pathway through the corridor to be able to get to an exit. So as long as um, you work to maintain a clear space around, whether it be furniture, preferably movable furniture, um, you know, a chair, a small stool or something that can be moved out of the very, out of the way very easily would be able to accommodate this. You would not want to put in tables that are, that are hard or difficult to move or get around um, that tend to reduce the corridor space um, significantly. Again, there are guidance, um, life safety guidances as far as space within the corridor to be able to exit the building. There are still ways to utilize the corridors for education, but you have to be cognizant, work with your architect to, to be able to maintain the clearances that you need. Is that also true as far as ADA type compliance? I don't know if you have to have certain pathways um, or with putting up, when we were talking about the, the partitions, if those were used in classrooms, are the, since those are temporary, can you do that without the, the same width that you might need for, for other spaces? Or do you think, or are they, are they more like furniture? I think they would be more like furniture. Um, again, it depends the size of the shield or whatever we're talking about for, for keeping the clearances between people. Um, but with ADA, there are, there are considerations not only for say wheelchair access, but if you had somebody that was um, visually impaired, there are guidances as far as heights of certain things. You have to be able, if, if somebody was using a cane, for instance, you need to be able to detect that there's something in the way so that they don't trip over it and so on. So yes, there are guidelines as far as ADA goes. Um, and again, it's, it's a matter of any disability, whether it be visual or somebody in a wheelchair or somebody dealing with crutches even. You, you, do, you just need to be able to, to get people through a clear space. Um, but I do, I do still think there's a way to be able to do this. I suppose those, um, an, an elevator protocol as well, just thinking more about, you know, we hand out those elevator keys. We might have to be judicious about that to keep uh, the number of people in elevators down. Yeah, and same thing with the bathrooms. There would, there would need to be protocols set up as far as cleaning the elevators, wiping down the buttons, whether it be inside the cab or outside. It's just there, there's going to need to be a lot of consideration from um, maintaining cleanliness. And it's just, it, it's obviously prevalent throughout the school. Okay, so then um, what about, has, Steve, have you thought at all about larger classes like band or choir and what types of spacing issues or spacing considerations might be at play there? Um, a very good question. <clears throat> what I would see as far as something like band, um, we are looking at right now um, a lot of consideration about using the outdoors as an outdoor classroom space. I mean, that would be, you know, pandemic or not, outdoor educational spaces are uh, something the kids thrive in. Um, 
being outside is just good for kids. I would see something like band or chorus being a prime example of being able to get outside, still have a larger group, maintain your distances, but you're actually, you know, contributing to the, the neighborhood, the, everybody within the neighborhood would be able to, uh, to enjoy what was going on. So I, I would see the outdoor as being a good option to be able to do that. Yeah, I live across the street from a high school and I always love it when their band is, is outside practicing when I'm working from home. It's a, it's a joyful noise. So uh, then sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, what about early childhood education where you're not really dealing with desks? Kids might be crawling around or um, otherwise down on the floor. Dana, any thoughts about how we're going to social distance our youngest learners? Well. I think that what you see in stores, but with a preschool uh, theme to it, like the letter A, the letter B, the letter C, <laughs> go stand on it, go stand on red, go stand on orange, go stand on blue. Um, you know, I, I, I do, I like what Steve said about outside just now. And I just think that's sort of the right, that's the theme that you want to have. I know that this is so overwhelming, but you have to think about all the ways we can do this. And I, you know, just, you know, think about it for a few minutes. If you are with a group, group of people in your building, you know, some ideas will start to flow. So I think it is going to be hard. You're going to have to look at less kids than even 12 because they're going to be mobile. And I think you're going to have to look about the, look at the other things like the hand washing stations, which in a preschool classroom, I think the benefit is you are sort of set up for them to be germy. So you usually have a sink in the room. You usually have your own bathroom. Um, you know, preschool teachers usually have disinfecting wipes and spray bottles and extra sets of underpants, all that stuff. Um, so you just have to remember that some of these things we do already and just how do we make them work now? What about isolation spaces for students that become ill at school? Steve, you have thoughts on that? I do. Um... Let me address that in just a second. First of all, bringing people into the school, I think is going to be an important thing. Um, I would see this as being a single point of entry within the school. Um, most likely where the existing secured entry might be. Um, again, everybody is used to coming in that particular spot. It is an isolated spot. It is also protected between the person coming in the building and the staff member that would be um, supervising it. It would be a place where you could do screenings. You could take the temperatures, you could hand out sanitizer, you know, hand sanitizer and so on. Basically do a wellness check before people come in the building. If you do come across somebody that is ill or, um, you know, whether it be a staff member or whether it be a student, I would see that they could be addressed. Typically, the nurse's station is usually near the main office, which is near the secured entry. So everything is in close proximity of one another. I would assume that there would be an isolation room adjacent to the nurse's station. So again, if somebody had an issue, they could go see the nurse if they said, okay, you do have a fever, we need to address this, they could be put in the isolation room. Preferably if it's possible that it has an outdoor exit from that room so that whether it be a parent coming in to take the student home, or if you needed additional medical services to come in, you have a way of being able to address that person again in isolation and take them outside without taking them back through the school I would see that as a best case, but um, I think an isolation room is absolutely going to be necessary. And again, best case scenario, if it were near the nurse's station, but if it's not, then at least so you have a designated spot so that people know where, where, where to go. 
All right, we had a question about masks. If they are required for students and staff, is the district responsible for supplying them? Anyone have thoughts there? I think that the district is likely going to be required to provide them because the unions are going to require us to provide them. I think they're gonna say, if we have to wear these in school, like any other bargaining unit that might have a portion, like a uniform, this is going to become part of that. And we're gonna either have to provide them or give them some compensation related to, to purchasing them. I have to say, depending upon what kind of mask you want, it might be something that you want to be able to provide for your staff so everyone's wearing the same thing. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we are going to have to look toward providing them to everyone and having you know a stash on hand for those people who forget to bring it in. That would definitely be a necessity for my eight-year-old who forgets everything, no matter how many masks I buy. So um, what about if kids and employees don't want to wear the masks? They say it's a civil liberties issue. Do we have a leg to stand on, given all the county sheriffs that have come out saying that they won't even enforce these restrictions? Yes, we have a leg to stand on. But... Um, <laughs> I mean, we control, as far, I'll, I'll address the student and then we can also address the, the employee. So we, we enforce responsible behavior in schools in a number of ways that the sheriffs would not. So um, what's gonna be key is that we communicate the expectations and not just the expectations, the, in the same way you communicate your code of conduct, whether you actually wanna amend a code of conduct or have a separate document, and we're clear about the possible, here's what you need to do. And if you don't do it, here's the potential outcomes. Will that uh, potentially get some reaction from your community when, when you put out a document that says, and maybe we wanna think about this, if after repeated requests, a student refuses to put on a mask, um, might we exclude them from the building, which would be considered a suspension. Yes, I think under SB 100, that would be su sufficiently danger, a sa safety concern. We could do that. We just need to make sure and give the notices first. Right. Yeah, I'm just, I'd like to step back a step and just think about the fact that, you know, there's not really like a, a civil liberty that is, I think, at issue here in the way that we think about it. You know, for example, and a, a good way to, a good comparison is the fact that we require students to have immunizations, right? So, you know, those, and we have some, some exemptions for that, but generally speaking, we are able to implement health and safety protocols for our students to keep them safe. Um, I mean, it would, you, you know, in terms of civil liberties, they'd have to be arguing that there's some sort of speech right or a religious right, you know, under the First Amendment. Um, I, those, I think, are really hard to, in this context, to, um, you know, to, to justify not wearing a mask. Um, so I do think that we will have flexibility to require students to do this understanding again and Jen sort of touched on this with the discipline that this is really difficult right to envision our kids going to school with masks and there's going to have to be as we get more guidance from ISB and IDPH and as we think about how to open um, there's going to have to be lots of communication with parents in the community and understanding how these these issues would, would work you know I think the same with with employees I'd let I'll let Dana and Shelley weigh in on that as well um, I think we can certainly, for safety reasons, direct our staff, um, you know, in keeping with health health guidance, health official guidance to, to be wearing masks in schools if we need them to be. Now, what about if there was a clear plastic shield for the teacher to use, but without a face mask? And the question is maybe that would help with kids who are hearing impaired so that they could lip read. Steve, do you have thoughts on the efficacy of that? I think it would be um, a very good option <clears throat> because again, the kid being able to, to see the teacher's lips, I think is, is a, a very good option. Um, it just comes down to, there would have to be some type of stand to be able to, to support this. Again, to, um, to have it in close enough proximity to the student um, to make it efficient. But um, I, do, I do see that as, as a viable option, absolutely. 
All right, and then another question um, dealing with space, what about school supplies? So we know that the CDC has said that kids are not supposed to be sharing school supplies anymore. Uh, how, should, should kids be bringing them from home? How do you think that they should deal with that, Steve? Um, I would say that they, they likely should bring their own from home. Um, what's interesting is in my neighborhood in the, in the mornings, I was surprised. In fact, it was yesterday morning. I saw a sign out talking about first day school supplies. There are signs, there are signs up already in our community for being able to supply what is necessary for when school starts up. Um, I do think the kids having their own supplies, bringing them in and Again, they have to remember to take them back home, though, so that they are maintaining their own. Um, I, I just I feel that that option is going to be more viable than than a shared um, a shared piece of equipment. It's just sharing stuff is not going to be the norm anymore. Um, and then we've also heard that, um, and I know I saw some news reports on this, that it, within the last 24 hours or so that the CDC's guidance has de-emphasized that school services are a transmission threat. Has anybody got thoughts on that? So, I mean, I think that um, that's a good segue into if, if really it is going to be social distancing and less about surfaces, then that's sort of a good chance for us to revisit maybe over the summer. Steve, can you think of any things that people should be doing um, over the summer to be prepared for social distancing? Well, and can I add to that before you answer? So a lot of the new reports about dangers, it has to do with I guess two factors that I don't think I was personally assessing in my assessment of risk enough. And one is time, the amount of time, you know, because of viral load matters and the airflow. And you've talked about outside is a good option. And I think that's a lot where that's coming from is with outside, you have much better air circulation and not the, the chances that you are exposed to the viral load that is, is a, uh, in danger, I mean, this is my understanding, it is reduced. So when you're looking at buildings and um, I mean, some of the reports are so specific, they show like floor maps of where um, uh, employees were sitting and it depended which way the air circulated um, from the, the, you know, air conditioning or heater who got sick because whatever way the wind was blowing literally um, blew the virus that way. And when you're in a space for a long time, uh, is there anything you can share about, I mean, different options for ventilation or obviously you can't rebuild a ventilation system, I wouldn't think by fall other than to do outside classes, but I, I don't know, open windows. <laughs> but do you, do you have thoughts about that, that those issues as, as well as the social distancing and less, less emphasis on surfaces? Well, from a, from a systems standpoint, um, let me relate this to, to, again, businesses that are considering reopening. Um, systems that have been shut down for the last two months need to be brought up and basically flushed out with fresh air. Um, there are requirements right now that, or at least recommendations, that the fresh air be maximized going through those units. Um, bringing more fresh air into the, into the building, um, the thought is that that will help disperse anything that might be in the air, uh, but also, but it just, it helps to, uh, to, to purify and clear, clear the air. Um, those recommendations I see probably being handed down to the schools to bring in more fresh air. Doing that, the only consideration or one of the considerations that needs to happen within a school district is um, from a maintenance schedule or ma maintenance standpoint, um, the district should be looking at what that would do to their systems. Bringing in 
additional fresh air during the summer, during the cooling months, um, may bring in additional humidity. So it's just a consideration that you need to look at um, from a district standpoint, as far as what that would do to the systems. If this continues into the winter, which who knows if it's going to, but if it does, and you are bringing in additional fresh air during a winter time, during a heating season, season, that can also have effects on mechanical systems because what it would do is potentially freeze up some of the heating coils in the system. So it's just a matter of from a maintenance standpoint or from a, from a scheduling standpoint, the, uh, the district personnel needs to look at how the additional fresh air requirements are going to have an effect on their systems. Do folks have thoughts about um, alternatives to lockers and cubbies for students' personal belongings from a space issue? I think this is gonna be a big big issue for schools. If, if the um, guidelines are currently saying don't really use uh, cubbies or lockers, what do they do instead? I think we're gonna see a lot of kids carrying around backpacks with all of their stuff in it and keeping it with them all day long. I mean, I think that's, you know, I have a middle schooler and that's, I think what the size of his backpack would seem to indicate to me that it's all in there all the time. Um, but I think that we're likely going to see that if, you know, when the winter months come and it's cold and they've got boots and jackets and things like that, I think we're just going to have to maybe space lockers out more or do something along those lines, but really being mindful that kids are going to have to be more responsible, I think, for their own stuff, uh, the same way they will be for their, you know, supplies that they're using in the classrooms. I don't know if anybody else has any other thoughts on that. I think going to have to go back to the good old fashioned elementary school rule when we were all in school. Only three people are going to go get their boots at a time. So that it doesn't get too rowdy and out of control. Well, there, there are furniture solutions also where there are backpack hooks that fit either on the side of a desk or on the back of a chair that would help to accommodate some of those things. Um, the other thing with some of the furniture these days, a lot of things are on casters or they are flip top so that the desks can be or the tables can be nested. What that would do is allow you to take some of that equipment, push it over to the wall and to help open up some of the rest of the space for the for the educational space. So I would just suggest that there are going to be furniture solutions that may help with with some of these uh, concerns about how backpacks are, uh, are to be handled within the classroom. We've hit on a little bit the idea of screening and we know that something is likely gonna be required, temperatures and other ways of checking to see if employees and students are, are ill before they come into the building. What um, thoughts do you have, Steve, about spacing issues that might come into play there? Um, say that one more time. I'm sorry, with spacing issues with... Yeah, so like the, um, if you're going to check every student's temperature when they come into the building, how, what should schools be thinking about as far as how to use their space to safely do that? Well, it may come down to, um, I mean, it could be part of the scheduling of when you, when you are bringing certain age groups in that, let's say, first grade's coming in and you have that scheduled for a certain period of time to not have, you know, 50, 60 kids outside the door at one point, but you're bringing in one class at a time to spread that out as far as the screening process. Um, I do think that that is, again, from a scheduling standpoint, it would be something that is more manageable than having a large herd of people standing outside the school. So we have a lot of questions that we aren't gonna have time to get to today, but we'll do our best to try to answer those at the beginning of our next webinar. I do wanna end with one thought that, that I think is important that came by way of a question. I'm gonna read this question because I think it's great. So my superintendent literally just sent me this CDC guidance and said to me, if we have to follow these rules, there is no way we will be able to open. Once again, we are significantly different because of uh, our size. Um, and I don't mean to suggest sedition, 
Um, although I do think the wheels are coming off the governor's orders, but what if we don't comply with everything because we simply cannot? Uh, Nikki, do you have thoughts on liability here or concerns with violating? What happens if a school wants to open, but they just don't feel they can hit every single one of these standards? Right. I mean, I, I think that is sort of the million dollar question right now. I, you know, again, we are still awaiting a lot of guidance here and we're still um, steps away. I'd love to hear if Steve sort of has a summer list of, of steps that he could take, that we could take to at least sort of try to figure out. Um, I do think that there's a, a, an important exercise here to just sort of take some steps with your staff um, to try to figure out, you know, bring in your building and buildings and grounds director, bring in your assistant soups for education, try to figure out what do you, what would you need to do to come into compliance? And as we get more guidance, um, and if there are things that are not feasible, we, you know, we understand that you're not going to be able to hit all of them. And so how do you create a safe space for students and staff, even within the limitations? But I think we can talk next week um, when we don't have Steve a little bit about liability issues about um, there's some great questions about labor and liability that I think we really want to touch on next week. But I'm wondering, Steve, if you have, based on all that we've talked about today, sort of a, a checklist or a, a few steps that people might start this process so they can see where they might end up. So the first thing I would recommend is consider a lot of planning. You know, we've covered a lot of topics, but having this discussion within your district um, of how you specifically can handle some of these topics and, and having those discussions sooner than later, I think is important. Really considering, again, going back to the students that are thriving right now with the e-learning, if it's working right now, and if your district can handle that and support that, Maybe that um, having that option available to the students, again, that are thriving, if it's working, why change it right now? If there's not the ability to have all of the kids in the building at the same time. So those that are having difficulty, whether they have <clears throat> the need for an IEP or just one-on-one -on -one instruction with, with a teacher, um, Look at scheduling a regular time for them to come in, whether it's one time, two times, three times a week, but have a regular scheduled uh, time for them to come in and be able to cycle those kids in and out of the building um, on a regular schedule, I think is something to consider. And in doing that, again, it might entail lengthening the, the normal school day. Um, the implications of that, I don't know what it is. I'm just looking at it from a scheduling standpoint and being able to accommodate the number of kids in the building. And then lastly, the, and I guess this is what I would consider just low hanging fruit, the concept of putting in hand sinks in every classroom that is gonna be accommodating a, a teaching space. It is something that is, can immediately address the need for the cleanliness of everybody in that room um, but making that available and having it utilized on a regular basis, I think is just something that to, for consideration. Okay, well, thank you so much, Steve, for joining us. We really appreciated having your insights today for our webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thanks so much. And thank you to the rest of our panelists as always, and to all of you for joining us every week and engaging in this discussion with us. Thank you for all of your questions. Again, we will try to find a way to get answers out on those. And we hope to see you next week when we talk about how to educate students with continued social distancing. Until then, please stay safe, take care, and we'll see you soon.